Bienvenido Lumbera is widely acknowledged as one of the pillars of contemporary Philippine literature, cultural studies, and film, having written and edited numerous books on literary history and criticism. A true patriot, at the height of the Marcos dictatorship, Lumbera had taken on creative projects, writing librettos for musical theater. Lumbera created several highly acclaimed musical dramas, such as Tales of the Manuvu, Ramahari, Nasa Puso Ang America, Bayani, and Noli Metangere. He was an esteemed writer who challenged Philippine society's colonial point of view and restored the poems and stories of vernacular writers to an esteemed place in the Philippine literary canon. In 1993, Lumbera received the Ramon Magsaysay Award, Asia's premier prize and highest honor. He was recognized for asserting the central place of the vernacular tradition in framing a national identity for modern Filipinos. The Ramon Magsaysay Award Foundation gathered young Filipino leaders to do a reading of Lumbera's thought-provoking and critically acclaimed essay, Philippine Theater in Confinement, Breaking Out of Martial Law, illustrating how art can challenge society's ills and could be used to stand up against even authoritarianism and tyranny. Sa panahon ng martial law, nang ito ay ideklara na ako ay isa sa mga aarestuhin. No? Dahil nagapangulo ako ng paksa, isang organisasyon ng mga aktivist ng Manonulat. Lantad naman talaga yung aking partisipasyon sa uh, kilosan. Kaya nag low ako, nakitira ako sa bahay ng isang uh, uh, kaibigan sa Tundo. At sa panahong yon hinihintay ko na magkaroon ng tawag sa akin para pumasok sa underground. Yung lipo ng ginalawang ko bilang isang political prisoner, ay lipo na ng mga taong kilala ko ang mga paniniwala sa buhay at uh, uh, alam ko ang kanilang naging karanasan sa kanilang pagkilos uh, bilang mga aktivista, bilang mga gerilya. Nung ako'y lumabas, iba naman ang buhay na dinatnan ko sa labas. No? Dahil noong panahon na yon sa mga department store, window. Usong-uso yung mga modelo, buhay na tao, gumaganap sa papel ng mga manikin. Nakadisplay sila. Uh, alam mo, buhay ang mga tao na ito, pero hindi sila uh, nakipag-usap, hindi sila gumagalaw. Kanyon, laki ng uh, epekto nun sa akin. Na, naiyak ako. At ito mga tao na ito na Tunay na tao, pero nagpapanggap na hindi tao. Parang ganun ang sitwasyon sa panahon ng martial law, string ko, na kailangan ng mga taong magpanggap na iba sila sa tunay na pagkatao nila. In the previous decade, a common complaint by aficionados of theater was that Filipinos did not know how to appreciate plays. Perhaps because movies had spoiled their capacity to enjoy a live performance by actors on stage. Activists had made use of short skits about matters that concern ordinary people to win audiences to their cause and found Tagalog an effective medium in drawing audiences and getting them to pay attention. Those who directed and acted on these skits called themselves cultural workers instead of artists, and the distinction was significant. As workers, 
they identified themselves with the common people in the oceans, instead of raising themselves as belonging to an elite specializing in art. The performance areas for the activist presentation were easily accessible. Streets, plazas, factory sites, open fields. Convenient sites where people can be gathered at any time with no need for special lighting or sound equipment. Theater had returned to its primitive site and found itself communing with the people. While mainstream theater, that is theater in school auditoriums and in the standard venues for play production, was in the process of solving its problem with a sparse audience. Filipino was gaining acceptance as a language for the stage. Before the national language was taught Badui, it was being buoyed up by the tide of nationalism and universities and colleges that had been infected by the nationalist ideas in Teodoro A. Agoncillos, A History of the Filipino People, and by Claro M. Rectos, Growing the State, as expressed in his speeches against subservience to the U.S. Embassy. Among theater people, the thrust was towards a definition of a sense of national identity. Among the intelligentsia, there appeared a marked interest in antiques and artifacts recovered in excavation sites, and newsmen were making the Philippine past a fashionable topic. Historical data related to the reform movement, the revolution of 1896, and Philippine-American War drew scholars, researchers, and even newspaper columnists and reporters to archival collections. In the Ateneo de Manila High School, young playwrights under the tutelage of Onofre Pagsanghan were writing and producing Tagalog plays as classroom exercises. Rolando Tino abandoned his experimental theater and turned to translating standard American plays like The Glass Menagerie and The Death of a Salesman even venturing into a revival of turn-of-the-century zarzuela with the production of Paglipas ng Dilim. By the close of the decade, Tagalog had established itself as the language of Philippine theater. The decade of the 60s, by its political and cultural thrust, may be cited as a turning point in the history of Philippine theater. The combined actions of the activist political theater and the cultural direction of mainstream theater, it defined the path of development of the technology and thematic concerns of the staging and the writing of future plays. The breakdown of the presidium staging, the cultural past and contemporaneous political experience as source of subject matter, the exploration through translation of foreign culture, and above all, the emergence of the people's languages media. These are the legacy of the 1960s. Proclamation 1081 sought to put an end to the political and cultural ferment of the 1960s. It put the movement for change under confinement. To take over and control and cause the taking over and control of all such newspapers, magazines, radio and television facilities, and all other media of communication wherever they are. Such total control of media meant total control of the public mind. Theater as a medium of communication is performative with live actors acting out what the play wants to say to the audience. A performance puts the actors under risk of arrest when the content of the play is deemed by martial law authorities as inappropriate. In the early years of the American occupation, performances of anti-American plays had been stopped and the cast and the writer arrested and fined by the courts. Fear of the military under Marcos made drama groups very cautious, and the first two years of martial law saw them putting safe Broadway musicals, entertaining zarzuelas and rock operas, and harmless comedies. The times, however, were much troubled by military abuses, perpetrated unsuspected subversives, and innocent civilians in urban poor communities. The military and the police have routinely raided communities where criminal elements were supposed to congregate. The martial law regime wanted to pride itself 
as having brought about peace and order in the country. And any disturbance of the law would mar that image. It was supposed to have created a new society and the suppression of lawlessness was meant to justify the declaration of martial law. The prohibition of rallies and demonstrations, then widespread in pre-martial law days, was supposed to have created an atmosphere conducive to the entry of foreign investments in the cities and the countryside. While open expression of dissent had been suppressed, the National Democratic Underground and other oppositionists were active in organizing among workers, students, and the religious. Cultural workers in pre martial youth organizations continued to secretly stir up discontent in communities. Then, in 1976, the labor union in La Tondena defied the no-strike van and the workers received support from activists among the youth and the religious. Although there was no media coverage from the Marcos-controlled publications, the strike was well covered by the underground press and by word of mouth. The strike was a signal that dissent could break through the repressive measures of the dictatorship. Protest theater under martial law had to camouflage its political intent in order to reach its public. Drama groups found the dictatorship's pretense at development concerns, a convenient cover for their effort to expose the social realities that belied the dictatorship's claims for the gains of Proclamation 1081. When the battalions of the Novotas Fishford protested loss of jobs through mechanization of the delivery could catch from the fishing boats to the shore, the 1976 play Buhay Batilio, Hindi Kami Susuko, was passed off as in line with the new society's concern for the poor. Similarly, the resistance of the Ifugaos to the building of the Chico River Dam in Amelia La Peña, Bonifacio's Angbundok in 1976 was made to dovetail with the developmental goals of the new society for the indigenous Filipinos. The Philippine Educational Theater Association, or BETA, took a bolder stance when it produced in 1977 Lito Tiongson's Walang Kamatayang Buhay ni Juan de la Cruz alias. Ostensibly, the play was supposed to depict a historical phenomenon when the American colonial administration developed the concept of zona whereby a community in the countryside is transplanted to an urban setting in order to deprive revolutionary shelter among the rural folk. In Tiongson's play, the Zona of the Americans was actually an allusion to the martial law military zona by which it hoped to contain the activities of the new People's Army in the countryside. The alias in the title was a reminder to the audience of the underground elements who used pseudonyms as they mingled with the civilian populace. Furthermore, Wulang Kamatayang Buhay implies that no matter military suppression, the underground movement will continue to struggle. The University of the Philippines' repertory was even more blatant in its defiance of the martial law regime. The fashion's elegance Pagsambang Bayan in 1977 sought the cover of religion in exposing the repressive rule of the Marcos dictatorship. But it was quite openly provocative in voicing its exhortations to the resistance. Various sectors, workers, students, Indigenous peoples, urban poor, take turns in urging the priest who serves as a central figure in the religious ritual that frames the narrative to take the side of the suffering populace. In 1983, the year Ninoy Aquino was assassinated, naked hatred for the dictator was evident in the street play Ilocula, Ang Ilocanong Dracula which did away with any protective cover and showed Marcos and Imelda, along with their daughter Aimee, as a monstrous threesome. Perhaps the best of the protest plays of the martial law, Buan at Baril in B-sharp minor in 1985 by Chris Miliado, 
consisted of four episodes that summed up the impact of the dictatorship on the lives of the Filipino people. Two brothers, one a peasant from the province and the other a worker who is a city resident, meet at a mass action in Manila, establishing the two classes which compose the majority of the Filipinos fighting martial law. A young woman at an evacuation center who turns out to have been gang raped by soldiers who raided a remote village in search of NPA rebels. A middle class matron dressing up to join a rally, talking to her maid, and in the process, making the audience aware of the politicization of the social class quite active in the anti-dictatorship movement. The wife of an NPA guerrilla fighter who had been killed in an encounter on her way to claim her husband's body in the military camp. Any student activist matching wits with the police officer who had been in his younger days, also a student activist, was picked up in the street for violation of the curfew set by the martial law government. Theater under martial law was placed in confinement as per Proclamation 1081. Cultural workers with links in the underground movement found ways of circumventing the prohibitions of the new society, sometimes breaking out of their confinement by riding on the programs ran by the government or by taking the risk of outright defiance of the authorities. Making theater in perilous times was a challenge that brought forth the creativity of the cultural groups and enriched the practice of the art of make-believe. Never. 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 Never again. Never, Never again. again. Never Never again. again.